Okay, well, um, a well, little different, so it's, All right. we have coughing this week in Linux, also known as Jordan. I, I have to say that now, because it's like, it's, he's, he's this week in Linux.com, people. He does have a site. It's like, it's like. It's only been there for a year and a half, so. <laughs> yeah. I think it was like I started up the, the videos and then day two I bought the domain. <laughs> yeah. Some like <laughs> actually my earlier I don't know. Yeah, I, it's I, I don't know. It, it's ah, uh, oh, it, 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 it's just sad what happened there. It, it's easier to keep track of you though through your site than it is Blippy. It, it's just it's. Just but I, I've had a lot of people say that the video through Blip looks better. Um, I actually turned off the HD video by default, so that makes it play a little smoother for a lot of people who didn't notice the HD button. And I don't know. I mean, Blip is definitely a viable option. It just really doesn't have the audience it needs yet. So that's why it's nice that they didn't completely kill my YouTube account. Yeah, neither do any of these when they start off. It, it, it's... Exactly. It, um, well, there have been two or three articles in the New York Times within the last week or two specifically devoted to blips, so it's just a matter of time before people do start to take notice that it is a very decent, very viable site. It's just, it is lacking a few features, like being able to subscribe easily. Well, no, no, see, that, that, that's the thing. At the end of the day, what is desperately needed, and, and you know, the, for, for all you venture capitalists out there who are like, what does the internet need right now? What the internet really needs is a cloud-based subscription thing where all sites have to do is put up RSS feeds and you can go, yeah, add this, add this, and it just puts it in a centralized management place so you know when stuff goes on here, here, and there. It's, I mean, you can't charge, nobody would pay for that service, but you could definitely sell ads well, in exchange for that. Especially not since Miro kind of does that for you. But, not, but the problem is not every site supports what, what Miro needs. It's like all the sites need to start supporting, you know, they don't have to have it built in, but they need to have what those types of sites need to jack in. Yeah. So, something to think about, something to get there. That's, ah, uh, of the, yeah, we actually, it's like, the, this week's Linux actually has Linux. I, I know, it's a shocker. It's like, we actually have Linux stuff. Of the Linux things we have, which one do you want to start with? Uh, you take a look. Two of these you already talked about. I, I, I'm annoyed about Firefox personally. I like. I thought, okay, Firefox five to unify it, and then they'll stop. Now that I've realized they're going on to the Chrome numbering system. Okay, so every point something's going to be a new number. Why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, it, it almost makes it worthless to number them if you're just going to throw the numbers out willy-nilly. Uh, with, with things like Linux distros that specifically number for a reason, like uh, you've got later mentioned here PC Linux OS's latest version, Ubuntu's numbering system, things like that. They, they number them specifically like that for a reason. But with Firefox, with Chrome, they're just, oh, look, we added... Hi, it's the next version. That's another number. Huge. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, it, it's honestly it makes it confusing because now um, you're gonna you're not gonna know. Uh, oh, is it a whole new thing, or is it just a minor update with some security patches or something? And it's like you're gonna have to well, go. How many people are honestly gonna look? Uh, 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 well, a lot of people won't look, but if if you're dependent on a lot of plugins and other things and so on and so forth. There are times you may want to hold off upgrading until like thing X you need catches up, and you know instantly by a version number. Okay, it's like I, I've never I was I, I I did some research before I upgraded certain computers here from Firefox three to Firefox four because I wanted to make sure all the things I needed had done their necessary work, or all if they were done in the process on. What this number? I have no clue. Okay, have they completely rebuilt it from the ground up again, or have they just added a minor revision and it's still the fourth version of the core? It has, it, 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 like you said, it makes the number worthless. It doesn't tell you anything except it's new. Yeah. <laughs> well, and to be quite honest, I, I was saying that about the kernel. I have a feeling. I think we both talked about that. I have a feeling that's a part of the reason they're doing the new numbering on the kernel is it's new, it's different, it's fresh, even though there's really, there are some 
differences, but it's not enough to merit well, no, and, and number. See, that, that annoys the heck out of me, like you're saying on the kernel, because the whole reason for having the numbering systems in the first place is so more technical people at a glance know this is blah blah. This is like, they just know. The average end user doesn't give a shit about the number. They know it's blah, 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 whatever. You know, it's... Well, and a lot of the average end user will see, oh, it's a new number. It's a big number. It's not just a minor update. Do I want to do... Uh, let me talk to my geeky friend, or let's hold off. Yeah. It's entirely possible people will still be on. I think I know a couple of people that are on Firefox 3 because they don't know that they can upgrade easily. Well, and, and uh, well, and that that has changed as of Firefox three six on. Um, whenever an update's available, you know this little thing pops up. An update for Mozilla is available. Do you want to update on all the Mozilla stuff on Thunderbird on Firefox? That's something they started adding to the newer versions. It's it, it's not uh, like Thunderbird five this week too. Yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 I'm on Thunderbird 3. It's like, I, I like the unified inbox design and the other features. That's, uh, But no, the newer versions of Mozilla stuff, it basically, if there's an update available, it will annoyogram you every time you launch it. Hi, there's a new version. Hi, there's a new version. Hi, there's a new version. Get the new version. Why don't you have the new version? It, it, it's like one step below what Chrome does of mandatory updates. That's... <laughs> Uh, so I, I think going forward, once people join anything current Mozilla, them being one or two versions back is going to become a, a lost thing, because just to shut it up, they'll click the button. That's, uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. Uh, actually, a perfect transition off of that is actually into, um, you know, Ubuntu dropping Synaptic. I, I, the people who, a couple of people have brought this up in the behind comments and sent emails and, and PMs and stuff. Um, I'm not seeing the big deal here. Um, yeah, they've dropped Synaptic, and I happen to like Synaptic. Uh, but it, from what I understand, they're not abandoning package managers altogether in favor of the Ubuntu Software Center. They are just kind of doing a halfway. They're like, we're not going to use Synaptic anymore. We're going to use this other package manager as an intermediary step to one day putting everything in the software center, which is where we ultimately want to go anyways. Is that kind of what they're doing? Or? As far as I understand, pretty much everything is the software center now. The software center installs the .dev files. Software center, of course, is like the app store for Ubuntu. So there's no... Uh, th removing Synaptic and Aptitude from the default install like they have done and are doing, all that's really doing is telling the, the people that are doing fresh installs that actually like those things, sorry, you've got to do one extra thing that you didn't have to do before. The experienced users are going to know how to do it. They're going to know how to get it back easily. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not like you can't get it back on there. It's just... It, it, it's the bad thing about it is... What I, what I foresee here is more and more of things like that are moving toward you have one option for how to do this. That's great for the absolute beginner user that doesn't want that many options, that doesn't want seven ways to install software. Yeah. But if, if that one way breaks, then you're completely out of luck. Well, of no. course, that, you know, they still do have AppGet and AppCache and all that, but... Yeah, let, let, let's be honest. The terminal's a little intimidating to... <laughs> Especially to a yeah. newbie, it's like it's the that, that's the disconcerting thing. If the one big overriding graphical package manager were to break for some reason, and you don't have Synaptic and you don't have GDB and you don't have whatever else, you have to drop to a terminal if you want to fix it. I I am foreseeing if that happens for any reason in the near future, there's going to be a a, a help post in the Ubuntu forums that goes launch terminal. Run these few lines to get Synaptic, then repair using Synaptic, or, or something like that. You know, run run this one apt command that will fix the software center. Then you go back to the software center. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> yeah. Well, but you're assuming the software center can be fixed. You know, that's. I don't think they're just completely let it break and stay dead. <laughs> if they did something that really, really borked it up completely, they'd have it fixed pretty quick. Because uh, that's, yeah. that's one of their key components at this point. That is a moneymaker for them now. 
No, I well, no, and that, that's the, honestly the thing that has me concerned about the uh, Synap excuse me, the uh, canonical whole software management thing and everything. Uh, I, I'm foreseeing a day in the near future, like within the next two to four years, that people will get okay. We need to develop for Linux, but instead of developing for Linux, they're going to develop for canonical, which. You know, they're, they're not going to get it. They're going to sign it. It's basically, all right, you have to use a canonical based distro whether you want to or not because that's who we made it for. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> all right, actually, a, a good example of that, the halfway kind of, the guys behind OMG Ubuntu, I guess they're a company called Oso. They made a game specifically for the Ubuntu Software Center. Uh, however, it is playable on other distros. You just have to know how to get it and how to pull out the, uh, the framework that it uses and a couple other things and specifically move that over to your system. But you have to buy it first. So it's, yeah. it's one of the bad of Ubuntu to get the software to put it on your other distro. So and, and, and no offense. Central, a centralized sales repository would be really nice. Something like the, uh, the open build service from Novell mixed with the canonical uh, software center, which basically comes down to click and run, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know it's amazing how many it's it's amazing how many times that project has tried to come out over how many names over the years, and just it can never quite get the traction it needs. And this little this little but it doesn't serve any sort of monetary or any sort of purpose for Canonical to develop something like that to have for all platforms. So I mean, well, no, it, it, a, if a we're central if, interface for for doing it for all the different distros, you just use the one software center front end. But now that it's strictly tied to canonical, I guess you could change who the payment goes to. I don't know. Well, it's no, kind of it, 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 and if we're honest, that's the whole idea behind the marketplace. The whole idea behind the marketplace is how do I force people to go through my marketplace, whether they want to or not? It's that that is iTunes. Yeah, and I'm sure Microsoft will do the same thing when they start adding their software things. It's like that's the way that business model is played. Now, um, even if we had an open one, you know, like for a project like Click and Run to really catch on and be commercially viable, even if it's open, it it has to be basically it would have to get like an eBay effect, where hi, we work with everybody. But we're the marketplace. We're the one everybody comes to, and that takes some effort to establish that brand. The, uh, and it, it, you you have to get everybody using that brand. Uh, to, to be honest, I really think that uh, Click and Run was a that its its failure was a product of it being so early. The fact that it was available several years back before. Linux on the desktop progressed and grew and changed. Yeah, like, when, 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 when was the Click and One project at its peak? I want to say 03, 04, I, or something it like that. Than 03, uh, it, at its peak, probably 03, 04. Yeah. I know I was using it in earlier than that because I, I was running, I think I was just running SUSE, or no, it was uh, Linspire or Lycoris or one of those starts with L and sounded like Windows. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think that's that's where it started, if I remember right. Well, no, and like we and we've said several times, you know, like uh, mo modern Linux, you know, the Linux you really want to put, you know, uh, for desktop wise, the Linux you want to compare against Windows and OS X as far as it just works, damn it, uh, really didn't start until 0506. It it really is a recent development that kind of hit its hit its running stride in 07. So it, it's That's more the drivers became a bit more, the desktop interfaces became a little bit more friendly. A lot of them did. So it just yeah, it became more user friendly overall. And uh, Canonical had a lot to do with that. But at the same time, the base distros, the Debian and the Red Hat, and the, well, they uh, all and, and, and both GNOME and KDE did a crapload of work at that time. It was just kind of a snowball effect of a lot of things hitting right. Uh, the 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 two eight hundred pounds gorillas GNOME and KDE did a, did a crap little work in those three years. Uh, Canonical threw a lot of money into Linux, and we also had uh, some reversions of the kernel that just it, it was it wasn't. I have to go get this stuff now. It's just here. It just works. Damn it! It's just, the coalition of all those things coming together made it where you didn't have to be technical in any way. You you could just 
plug the CD in and it just kind of worked. <laughs> Which, as long as your hardware was supported, there were drivers available. And, yeah, yeah. W w which, like I said, some distros went through the extra effort of making sure they added all the packs on to make that was the case. It's, they're those few distros that put in the end user friendly category. <laughs> uh, to, to be quite honest, we, we've all been beginner Linux users at some point. When I was a beginner, which was 2001, 2002 ish, uh, whenever I would install a distro and it had a text based installer, that was an immediate turn off for me. One of the first distros I used, I think SUSE had one and then Ubuntu had one. And those were two that really drew me into using Linux more and more because I could very easily install it with a point and click interface that I was accustomed to because I was a Windows yeah. user at the time. Uh, I, well, I have two beginnings for Linux. I have my beginning way back, uh, uh, is, it was either late 90s or early aughts. This was back bef when, when before it was Madrivo. I want to say Mandark, you know, before it became Madrivo. Mandrake. Yeah, Mandrake, thank you. Uh, yeah, for some reason I keep calling it Mandark, I don't know. Probably because Dexter's Laboratory was on at the time. Because Dexter's Lab is awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but no, it's like, it was, uh, it's like uh, and it, it was one of those, uh, it wasn't cooked yet, but you, it, it was gooey, it was something you could tell if this just get because you still had to do things like manually set up your TCP IP connection and so on and so forth. I was like, okay, I know how to do it, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> but yeah. a, 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 as I screwed around with all the stuff, I'm like, you know, if this just gets a little more cooked, it's going to be great. And I kind of half looked on it every now and then. Uh, and then back, you know, in the era we're talking about with Click and Runs on, I, I came back in 04 and so on because it had gotten cooked enough that I didn't have to make mountains out of molehill and over that three to four year period it got very cooked and enough that it could actually replace windows for me and other things. It's like, I'm not a purist, that's, I'm a philosophizer. <laughs> it's like, uh, although the fact that it was able to cross from everything manual geek to where it is now in that short seven year span, you know, really makes me wonder where the hell it's going to be at the end of this decade, you know, it's like, because it's not like the growth has slowed any, you know, <laughs> or, uh, 